Hello everyone, my name is Bill Rapisi, I'm the Executive Director of the Lymphatic Research Foundation and welcome to LRF's bi-monthly symposium series. LRF's mission is to fight lymphatic disease and lymphedema through education, research, and advocacy. And the symposium series is made to connect patients and medical practitioners with each other and with the latest developments in the field. Today, we will hear from Dr. David Chang, who will give us an overview of surgical treatments for lymphedema. I first heard Dr. Chang speak at a conference in Atlanta, and I can tell you we are most fortunate to have him with us here today. Dr. Chang is Deputy Department Chair in the Department of Plastic Surgery, Director of the Center for Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery, and Director of the Center of Microsurgery Research and Education at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. Dr. Chang specializes in complex microsurgical reconstructive surgery in cancer patients with a primary clinical and research focus in breast reconstruction and restoration of extremity defects such as lymphedema. Remember, this is a live stream event, so for those of you that are watching at your computers, you can always type in your questions to Dr. Chang uh, during the course of the symposium. Also, after the symposium, you can always access this online at the LRF website, www lymphaticresearch.org. And finally, mark your calendars on uh, July 26th at 11 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time. Dr. Babak Marara from Wild Medical College of Cornell University will speak on cellular mechanisms of lymphedema. Without further ado, I turn this symposium over to Houston and Dr. David Chang. Thanks very much. Good afternoon. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to be participating today's uh, lymphedema Research Foundation's uh, lecture. Uh, I was asked to uh, talk today about microsurgical treatment of lymphedema. Uh, so over the next uh, 30 to 45 minutes, uh, I'd like to talk about uh, overview of lymphedema, uh, microsurgical treatment options. I'd like to share with you my personal experience with this microsurgical treatment, and also uh, share with you some of the challenges we still face in treating uh, lymphedema. So lymphatics uh, was first uh, discovered by uh, Aselli in 1600. And what we know about lymphatic system is that it removes excess fluid from body tissues. It uh, absorbs fatty acid and transport fat to the circulatory system. And it's also involved in our immune system and can act as a pathway for cancer spread such as breast cancer and melanoma. And under our skin, there are small lymphatic capillaries which drain to pre-collectors and then which uh, drain to the larger uh, collecting vessels which eventually drains into the uh, circulatory system. And the lymphatic drains by contraction of the surrounding skeletal muscles and also lymphatic vessel itself has a smooth muscle cells which contract and stimulated by the sympathetic nervous system. So lymphedema occurs when there is a failure of the lymphatic system and results in a high protein uh, edema. The causes can be either primary, which is an inherited condition and can occur in infancy or during puberty or even uh, at, uh, after age of 35. But most common causes are secondary, either due to surgery or radiation, damaging the lymphatic system, or parasite. Worldwide, parasite, filariasis is the most common cause of lymphedema. They uh, get into your lymphatic system and obstruct the lymphatic vessels and cause lymphedema. In developed countries, lymphedema occurs most commonly due to a damage of the lymphatic system uh, particularly following uh, treatment of cancer where the lymph nodes are either removed or uh, radiated and of course the highest incidence occurs in breast cancer patients because breast cancer is a very common uh, cancer. And it is believed that up to 5 million Americans suffer from lymphedema and up to 50,000 new cases of lymphedema are diagnosed each year. It is a very debilitating to the patients. It is heavy it's deforming, painful, often it is prone to infection. It's a lifelong problem. Currently, there is no definitive treatment. and It is poorly understood. Initially, it starts out uh, as a soft pitting, 
edema, which then progresses to uh, non-pitting edema, eventually leading to irreversible structural damage, leading to tissue fibrosis, and then the damage of the, the smooth muscle cells within the lymphatic vessels, so lymphatic vessels are no longer functioning. And this is a study that was done uh, and published in 1996, looking at the lymphatic vessel walls. And this is a normal lymphatic vessel wall, which actually looks quite a bit like a regular blood vessel with the different type of uh, layers, including smooth muscle cells. And this is in lymphedema patients. And this is a uh, section taken from the upper uh, arm, mid arm, and distal arm. And what it shows is a destruction of the endothelial cells, particularly the smooth muscle cells within the lymphatic system. And it tend to uh, progress proximal to distal. So if you have lymphatic damage proximal to the arm in the axilla, the damage is worse in the upper arm, and then it progresses down to the uh, distal arm. So what is the cause of lymphedema to the patient and to the society? And this is a study that kind of looked at that, looked at the uh, incidence, treatment cost, and the complication of lymphedema after breast cancer among women of working age. And we, they compared the medical cost and the rate of infections likely associated with lymphedema between a woman with breast cancer-related lymphedema and a control group. And uh, what was found was that patients with breast cancer-related lymphedema patients had significantly higher medical costs, ranging from uh, approximately $15,000 to uh, $23,000 per year, and was twice as likely to have lymphangitis or cellulitis, which is infection of the arm, compared to the uh, uh, control group. And if we use this figure, estimated cost to the society for treatment of lymphedema is over $3 billion a year. The incidence of lymphedema uh, is likely to increase because of the increased rate of obesity. There's increased use of radiation therapy for treatment of cancer. Patients are getting older and also there are more survivors. So with all these combinations, it is likely that the incidence of lymphedema will increase uh, over the next uh, years uh, and with the more uh, lymphedema-related problems. Currently, the surgical treatment of lymphedema can be divided into excisional type of procedure and physiological procedures. Charles procedure is a, one of the uh, examples of excisional procedure where the skin and the fat tissue is removed all the way down to the fa fascia and the muscle and then is skin grafted. This is a photo from a journal uh, where the lymphedema limb is completely removed uh, f uh, down to the fascia and then skin grafted. So it, this is like a major burn and skin grafting. And because there is no skin and fat, certainly lymphedema will not occur, but the uh, area where it's been skin grafted really looks, uh, does not uh, look very, uh, it, it is very difficult for patients to uh, manage and uh, it, it does not look good. Now liposuction uh, is another way of treating lymphedema and it can be effective. The only, the only thing is that once the liposuction is done, patient must wear the garment 24 seven around the clock. Once you remove the uh, stocking, uh, within a day or so, or a day or two, the lymphedema will recur, and you will have to have, have another uh, liposuction or another treatment. So it is not a very practical solution for most patients. Now, physiologic procedures. All these procedures involve microsurgical uh, treatment approach, and one of the more commonly used uh, physiologic procedure is the lymphovenous bypass procedure, which I've been doing since the uh, year 2005. Essentially what it is is it creating a detour of obstructed lymphatic system into an open venous circulation. First report of lymphovenous was in 1960 uh, by uh, Jacobson in a uh, dog model where he bypassed the lymphatic uh, to a, uh, vein, a branch of a femoral vein. Uh, clinically, uh, it was, uh, became more popular in the 1970s with O'Brien from Australia uh, reporting his experience but uh, uh, it really did not uh, gain popularity because uh, the high venous pressure was felt to uh, be too high for lymphatic uh, uh, 
lymphatic drainage from the lymphedema into the venous system. Now in 2000, a super microsurgical uh, approach was uh, introduced where very small lymphatic uh, vessels under the skin are and most the branches of a vein where the venous pressure is low, theoretically allowing the lymphatic flow to uh, able to drain into the lymphatic system with the minimal uh, backflow. And this is an approach that I started to use in 2005. And in 2010, this there was a study that was published uh, looking at uh, my earlier experience. Uh, and we were able to demonstrate that approximately 35% reduction in volume differential could be seen on average uh, after about 12 months. And the way we measured our patients for the volume differential is by using this parameter, which is, uses a a computer uh, and the infrared light scan to measure the circumference every half centimeters and then calculates the total volume of the limb. So this is one of my first patients. Uh, she has had a lymphedema of her right arm for about two years. It does not look that severe. She's about 16% larger, but she suffered from repeated infection of the arm. We did the five bypasses uh, in her arm. And at one year, uh, her arm went down now it's only about 7% larger, so there was 55% reduction in volume differential, but more importantly, she did not experience any more events of infe uh, infection. And she became one of my biggest uh, advocates uh, early on. And uh, here, uh, here the, in this uh, article, two years post-surgery, uh, she couldn't be happier with her results. Her right arm is now just 7% larger than her left in the normal range. Even more, the decreased swelling allows her the freedom and range of motion she had before breast cancer. This is not another patient uh, with her left arm being 33% 33, 33 larger than her right arm. And at three months after lymphovenous bypass, the arm went down 40% uh, reduction in volume differential. But one of the difficulties of doing the surgery earlier on was that it was very hard to find lymphatic channels we essentially had to uh, bring a microscope and just start searching for them. Uh, now, one of the advances since then is the use of indosangrene uh, fluorescent lymphangiography, where we uh, inject a indosangrene dye, which is readily available in uh, all the hospital. It's commonly used for medical purposes. It is uptaken by the lymphatic system, and you can see the uh, uh, lymphatic vessels prior to doing the surgery, as you can see in this uh, video and you can map out the lymphatic system in the arm before the surgery is performed. So uh, in the OR, before the surgery is done, I do the uh, ICJ lymphangiography like so, and then mark out the lymphatic system using this uh, uh, guide of the, um, the lymphangiography, and then identify the uh, best locations for lymphovenous bypass. And the entire surgery is performed through these small incisions under the microscope, and here is a, a video showing how the surgery is being done. And this is uh, being done under the microscope, a very uh, just edited version of uh, how the uh, surgery is performed. Here we found the lymphatic vessel. You can see the clear lymphatic. And we have to use a special instruments. These are special, very small microsurgical instruments. And then we have found the little vein next to it. And here's a vein, and here's the lymphatic. And then we will stitch them together with a very small sutures that are finer than uh, uh, human hair. So this one grid is one millimeter, and this is a, about 0 0.3 millimeter uh, anosmosis. And uh, we will connect them together using these uh, small needles and sutures. And then once the bypass is performed, one way we can check to see if it's working is inject this little blue dye, which goes into the lymphatic system, as you'll see. So this dye is one of the dyes that we use is called the lymphozurin dye. It goes into the lymphatic system, and now it's going to go into the venous system and demonstrating that there is a good patency uh, of the dye into the lymphatic system. 
So here is a lymphatic vessel, and this is after the anosmosis, lymphatic, uh, the blue dye going from the lymphatic system through the anosmosis into the vein. And here's some other examples of lymphatic vessels. And then here's after the bypass, and here the dye is going through the anosmosis. And these small incisions then are uh, sutured. And this is a study that we recently uh, reported on a national meeting, looking at our 100 consecutive patients prospectively, and 96% of patients felt better after surgery, and 74% of patients we were able to uh, demonstrate uh, measurable uh, difference. And at one year, there was about 42% reduction in uh, volume differential on average. And so when we do the ICGN, you can see different types of uh, severity of lymphedema, and you can stage them, stage one being the uh, most mild and stage four being the most severe. And what we found is that patients with the milder form of lymphedema, stage one or two, had a significant improvement of a 60% reduction in volume differential. But once the patient develops more severe lymphedema, stage three or four, the, the measurable difference following the surgery was not as great, uh, a 15% reduction in volume differential. So the patients, what we found is that the good patients, the patients who benefit the most from lymphovenous bypass are Patients with a mild form of lymphedema where the lymphatic vessels are still working and there's a minimal tissue fibrosis. Once the lymphatic vessels don't work as well and there's a lot of uh, tissue fibrosis, they do, not, uh, they do not respond as well to a lymphovenous bypass procedure. So this is a patient who had lymphedema for five years. Her uh, left arm is 32% larger than her right arm. And here's the ICGN uh, study uh, showing the lymphatic vessels, even going up to the axilla. So she's stage two classification. And at 15 months after the bypass, her left arm is only now 12.6% larger. So there was 61% reduction in volume differential. Now this is another patient who had lymphedema only for a year and a half. And her arm is 18% larger than her right arm. And, but ICGN study shows that she has stage three uh, lymphedema with the severe dermal backflow and, and only few lymphatic vessels visualized. Now we did seven bypasses and at three months she felt much better, arm was softer and lighter, but when we measured her with our parameter, we really did not find any reduction, a noticeable reduction in volume. Now another procedure that has gained a lot of popularity over the past few years is vascularized lymph node transfer. So the first uh, report of vascularized lymph node transfer was in 1990, uh, also from Australia, in a dog model where they transfer lymph nodes into the dog's leg. Uh, clinically, Corin Becker from France uh, uh, has been uh, active in, has uh, really uh, uh, advocated this procedure, and this is one of her publications from 2006 where 24 uh, women with uh, lymphedema, uh, the lymph nodes were taken from the groin and transferred. And she reported that in 22 patients, 22 out of 24 patients had a significant improvement with only two patients where the improvement was not noted. So how does lymph node transfer work? Well, one thought is that lymph nodes, once it's transplanted, will, sprout, will promote new lymphatic growth and then we'll connect with the, uh, with the lymphatics in the uh, arm or the leg and then suck the fluid in. Another uh, thought is that it may act like a pump. And this is a study from uh, Taiwan where, where they will take the lymph nodes and uh, actually connect it to the uh, distal arm instead of in the axilla and then connect it to the artery in the vein. And their thought is that the uh, lymph nodes will act like a sponge to suck the excess lymphatic fluid and then pump it into the venous system. Now, this is a, a patient who, who had mastectomy, lymph node dissection and radiation, developed a severe lymphedema of the right arm, 50% uh, larger, and does not, uh, also does not have a breast. And I see a lot of these patients, and surprisingly, their main concern is not the absence of the breast, but a lymphedema. Uh, patients would prefer to get something down for lymphedema uh, and wait on doing a breast reconstruction. 
but uh, but way we've been able to approach this uh, is that we've been able to uh, do both taking the tissue from the abdomen to make the breast and then take some lymph node att attached to the abdominal flap and we will use this uh, uh, as a lymph node transfer so abdominal tissue is blood supply is dissected and then is used to make a breast of course the blood vessels has to be connected to the vessels in the chest so the tissues are live tissue living tissue and then the lymph node transfer will, lymph nodes will also be connected to the vessels so that these are living lymph nodes and not just uh, dead lymph nodes so uh, here she is uh, at six months following the reconstruction and uh, uh, she has a now a breast and also her arm has been reduced uh, significantly with a 51 percent reduction in volume differential are there any risks to lymph node transfer? Well, one concern that we have by taking the lymph nodes, particularly from groin or axilla, is that it may cause lymphedema of the existing uh, or, the, or the donor uh, arm or leg. So this is study done from Finland, where they measure the lymphatic function uh, of the normal leg as well as the leg where lymph nodes were taken out. And what we found is that, what they found is that, even though clinically now the patient developed lymphedema, the leg where lymph nodes were taken out, there was a significant uh, reduction in the, in the lymphatic function uh, as measured by the transport index. And this is a report that, this is a, a paper that was recently reported uh, from France where uh, physical therapists saw a lot of patients who had surgery at another hospital with lymph node transfers. And what they found was that um, there were 34 patients where X-ray lymph node dissections were transplanted in 26 patients, and they found that, 10 pa that uh, there was a six patient developed chronic lymphedema, six out of 34. It's pretty significant. And other 10 patients had uh, lymphedema-related com uh, complications, such as lymphocele. Uh, and so they, uh, the, the conclusion is that X-ray lymph node transplantation may in engender severe chronic complications particularly persistent iatrogenic lymphedema. Further inv investigations are required to evaluate and clearly determine its indications. So is there a way we can minimize uh, causing donor site related lymphedema? And one way you can do is the what's, what's called reverse mapping. This is a technique that, this is a uh, borrowing from a technique that our breast surgeons or, uh, or oncologic surgeons often use. Well, where they inject a, a radioactive um, isotope into the limb, and then it will travel to the central nodes, nodes that uh, drain the uh, arm or the leg. And uh, we, we are able to, using, uh, using a uh, uh, machine, we can able to detect which lymph nodes are critical to drainage of lymphatic from their arm or the leg. So you can do this also um, in our lymphedema patients. So if I'm going to be taking lymph nodes from the groin to transplant to the arm, we can inject a, a radioactive isotopes into the foot and find the central nodes. So when we're taking the, when we are harvesting or when we are taking the lymph nodes from the groin, we stay away from those critical lymph nodes and take, the, take only lymph nodes that are not essential to draining the uh, leg or the arm, minimizing the development uh, of uh, uh, lymphedema. Because the last thing you want to do is create another lymphedema. And another solution is to use lymph node transfers that will not cause lymphedema. For example, uh, we developed a uh, flap from the neck uh, where the large lymph nodes, and then we can take a little skin and some of the fat and the lymph, lymph nodes together, and there is no risk of developing lymphedema to the arm or the leg or uh, even to the head. So here's a patient with a severe, severe lymphedema. As you can see, it's almost 200% larger than the uh, left leg and he has repeated the infections and pain. So we took a lymph node uh, from the neck, and you can see it lighted up here, and uh, transferred to the uh, ankle, and then uh, connected the artery and the veins. And uh, within three months, you can see the huge difference already. There was about 30% uh, reduction uh, immediately and early on. And uh, here is the, where the flap was taken, and here's a scar. And this is another uh, patient uh, who have developed lymphedema of left leg uh, following kidney transplant. And here, the, uh, again, the flap is taken from the neck and then transplanted to the ankle. And you can see at three months, the significant difference in the leg, uh, uh, 
gradually, visually. In fact, I just saw her today, and here is the, where the flap was taken. We call these flaps, and this is her scar, uh, very well healed scar. So finally, this is a, a patient with a severe lymphedema uh, for treatment of cervical cancer. She had lymphadenectomy, radiation. Obviously, you can see that uh, she really cannot function regularly on a daily basis. So uh, here are some lateral and posterior views. So what are our options? Can, is she a candidate for these microsurgery procedures? Not really. Uh, you know, what are the options? I, I guess one of the key questions is that if she has something that early on, could this have been prevented? So here she's in the operating room. And uh, what we decided to do is uh, actually uh, remove the tissue and do a debulking procedure. And then skin grafted. Skin grafts were taken from the specimen that was already removed. And the dressing is placed. And here she is. A, while the, this may look uh, morbid, she is she is so much happier now. She's able to walk normally, and she's actually being, uh, going back to work. And uh, major difference in her life. So we are in search of ideal surgical treatment of lymphedema. That would be one that repairs or reestablishes lymphatic function, and that actually cures, which means that there is a com complete and permanent improvement of lymphedema without a need for patient to wear compression garments while causing minimal morbidity. Now, lymphovenous bypass, it is technically challenging, uh, and results are inconsistent. I think the best case patients are patients with a milder form of lymphedema. They seem to do, uh, do the best following lymphovenous bypass. Lymph node transfer. Again, we are not completely sure what the mechanism is. Is it lymphangiogenesis, or does it act like a pump? Perhaps it does both. And, uh, we're also concerned about potential donor cell morbidity causing lymphedema from the site where the lymph nodes were removed. Suction oscillopectomy, liposuction. It is effective, but you have to always wear your garment 24-7. When you take it off, lymphedema comes back. So it really is not a uh, solution. Debulking procedure, yes, it will work, but then you have very uh, severe uh, morbidity the, the leg or the arm uh, looks like you have severe burn. So currently, there is no ideal solution. Uh, we need more research. There is a lot about lymphedema that we do not understand, including lymphatic anatomy, physiology, and the pathophysiology. Uh, so what do we really know about lymphatic system and lymphedema, about anatomy, physiology, pathophysiology? Well, the last time lymphatic anatomy was studied, uh, and the, the data that we still use is a study from 1800s by SAPI. Since then, uh, no, re, no uh, updated uh, anatomic study of lymphatic system, system have been uh, performed. And currently, uh, we are doing that. We are remapping the lymphatic system in cadaver to look, at, uh, to look at the lymphatic anatomy of the arm, of the chest, of the breast, and also looking at the correlation between the lymphatic system of the upper extremity and the breast in cadaver models. Uh, we are also looking at the pathophysiology. Uh, is it caused, uh, is it, uh, caused by uh, anatomic disruption? Is, the lymphedema, is there any genetic component to this? Or is it caused by uh, adipose uh, or fat deposition abnormality? So uh, we're studying these different types of mechanisms in animal models uh, to look at the, uh, whether it's the fibros fibrosis that causes the uh, lymphedema or is it the genetic uh, component to that. Nevertheless, uh, lymphedema is a, a significant problem to a patient and to the society. Currently, there is no optimal cure and uh, we expect the incidence of lymphedema to, lymphedema to continue to grow. One hurdle that we have is that many insurance companies do not cover surgical treatment lymphedema as they feel uh, it is still investigational. Uh, uh, and we face this uh, uh, same type of uh, uh, scenario uh, in, er in 1900s with the breast cancer. Breast reconstruction was not covered by insurance, but now it is, it is covered 
through the uh, Women's Health and Cancer Rights Act of 1998. And we hope that uh, in near future that the all insurance companies uh, will uh, also uh, cover uh, surgical treatment of lymphedema. Now, many uh, companies do cover it, though. So, what does scientific studies and experience, clinical experience, tell us about microsurgical treatment of lymphedema? Well, there have been a, a, probably at least 100 or more studies from all over the world uh, that have demonstrated the efficacy of the microsurgical uh, uh, approach to treatment of lymphedema. Uh, in conclusion, uh, does it cure lymphedema? In most cases, no. Does it improve the severity of lymphedema? In most cases, it does, yes. Does it reduce the complications related to lymphedema, such as infection? In most cases, yes. Does it improve patients' quality of life? In most cases, in most cases yes. If you ask our patients, most will say yes. And this is a, uh, another patient from uh, more recently, uh, about uh, two years ago. Uh, a patient uh, saw and felt immediate improvement with her arm's blood flow, movement and color. A week later, she saw her elbow for the first time in four years. Today, she can see the bone and muscle definition, and she's back swimming. I know this isn't a cure and that I will have to manage my lymphedema for the rest of my life, but the surgery made it manageable for me. Thank you, and I'm, now I'm ready for any uh, questions. Thank you. Go ahead. So staging, uh, how do you determine what stage you are? Um, so the staging, there are different staging systems that are advocated by different uh, doctors as well as uh, different organizations. Uh, so it could be from stage one through four or stage one through five. Uh, and there is no consensus uh, what the best uh, way to stage is. Uh, but the way that we've been staging for surgically is that because we now have a, can give more information with the endocyne green lymphangiography, when we do that, we can really see uh, how many or uh, functioning lymphatic vessels you have and how much uh, dermal backflow, that's the tissue that has a backed up lymphatic fluid, and I think that's the better way for us to evaluate and stage lymphedema rather than just with clinical examination, which is very subjective. With clinical examination, you examine a patient's arm or leg and touch and feel, and then we stage it that way. With the lymphangiography, you can actually visualize it. You can actually visualize the changes in your lymphatic system. So uh, for us, that's how we start to uh, stage our patients. Uh, when, uh, patients, uh, particularly our surgical patients, uh, who have this information available. After surgery, continue, uh, needing to use garments, is that necessary? I tell the patients that even after the surgery, uh, uh, you still have lymphedema. Even if you have improvement in, in the severe to lymphedema, you still have lymphedema. So you, you still need to treat, do the same thing you were doing before, which meaning uh, wearing garments, uh, doing massages, but with surgery, perhaps your massages and your uh, uh, will, would uh, work better, and also the garment sizes may go down, but you have to uh, remember that you still have lymphedema. And uh, the patient, uh, for example, one patient came and saw me today, she still has lymphedema, but what she tells me is that when she elevates the leg, it goes away much faster. And when she massages uh, and then uh, massages it, the swelling goes down much quicker than ever before. So I think it is very important. And now there are a few patients where lymphedema improves so much that they don't, do not need to. And that's great. But I want patients to understand those are, that's probably more of a uh, exception rather than the rule. And uh, so unfortunately, uh, I do tell patients you have to continue to take care of lymphedema. Uh, as you did before surgery, but your responses will be better and uh, uh, maybe uh, it's possible that in the, uh, with the significant improvement, uh, it is possible that they may not have to in the future, but uh, for the time being, yes. If you're stage one lymphedema, what, are you a candidate for surgery and if so, which one? Yeah, the earlier uh, uh, patients I think are good candidates for lymphovenous bypass procedure. It's minimally invasive. It's almost uh, outpatient surgery. 
You could, I usually keep them overnight for our IV antibiotics, but they can go on the same day. Uh, there's really no pain. Uh, other than the small uh, scars that they obtain, there really is very minimal morbidity. And, and I think they are actually the best candidates because the earlier on you can uh, uh, manage lymphedema, uh, I think uh, it, will, uh, it can prevent the progression of lymphedema to a more severe stage where then it becomes very difficult to manage. So I think the earlier patients also do much better with the lymphovenous bypass. So I think the uh, stage one patients are uh, very good candidates. Has this been done on uh, children or pe uh, with pedi uh, pediatric lymphedema or congenital lymphedema? Yes, uh, uh, we have done a uh, number of uh, patients, uh, children uh, who have, uh, who are, some are born with lymphedema or who, who develop very early on, uh, and they will be due to a primary lymphedema, uh, congenital, and they also uh, can be uh, uh, a good candidate for uh, these procedures. Has there been research um, with stem cells instead of doing trans transferring? Um, there are some studies being done, uh, particularly in animal models, but the thing with the using stem cells is that particularly a, in our setting where most of my patients are cancer patients, using stem cells perhaps could lead to uh, growth of uh, cancer and maybe dormant cancer that are, are staying around. So we are, it is not being used clinically, uh, but uh, there are studies being done with stem cells, uh, particularly to help regenerate lymphatic vessels and such uh, in animal models. Is, are these surgeries being done in other places in the U.S., such as uh, Virginia, Delaware, or Maryland? And another person asked if it's being done in Canada. There are uh, other places where I know there are a lot of surgeons are right now are very much interested in um, lymphatic surgery, and uh, uh, and there are probably a, f a few surgeons who are doing it um, or trying to do it. Um, I I'm trying to think if there's anybody who who are doing. Uh, significant amount in the area as you mentioned, but I think there are some surgeons who are interested and who, uh, who, who are doing those procedures, not on a high volume, but on a occasion, uh, occasionally. And the risk to having the surgery again on uh, the donor site? Um, yeah, the donor site again is that, you know, whenever you take lymph nodes from groin, uh, you are concerned that perhaps you are reducing the lymphatic function of that leg and, and maybe leading to lymphedema. Or if you're taking from the axilla, uh, perhaps you can create a lymphedema of the arm. So that is a concern. And uh, uh, there are ways you can minimize it, for example, uh, by doing a reverse mapping uh, where you uh, are selectively taking lymph nodes that are not uh, essential to draining the leg or limb. So that would be the one way you can minimize uh, causing lymphedema uh, of the uh, area where the, you're taking lymph nodes. And also if you take lymph nodes from the neck, there are other areas where you can take lymph nodes, for example, on the neck or even inside the abdomen, uh, your omentum. Uh, you, gotta, you do have to make an incision and go into the abdomen to take lymph nodes, but certainly uh, you, you would not cause any lymphedema. So uh, there are ways you can uh, minimize that. Uh, as far as the, the surgery with the leg lymphedema the, compared to the arm, are the, are the leg lymphedema results just as well? In my experience, uh, leg lymphedema results are not as good as arm. And as you can expect, uh, the one main reason is that uh, the leg is usually more dependent. So um, either we are walking or sitting, and uh, uh, that is a huge difference. Second is that a leg is a much bigger structure than the arm, so there's a lot more lymphatic load uh, that needs to be drained, so it is more difficult. So leg lymphedema is, are more difficult to manage, but uh, I've had uh, some uh, uh, impressive results with legs as well, but it is more uh, difficult, in my experience, uh, than the arm. Has there been any research as, uh, with organ donors with lymphedema? such as lymphatic transplantation, mm -hmm. for example? Yeah, from, or, from 
Yeah, there's something that uh, that's also being studied, uh, possible lymphatic transplantation, but uh, um, to the best of my knowledge, that has never been done clinically. Uh, and also, main thing, main I think main uh, obstacle will be not necessarily surgical, but more of a immunologic, where the patient uh, have to become immunosuppressed, perhaps with the with the rejection and things like that. But that is something that is being uh, studied uh, at uh, various centers, but has not been performed yet. How about uh, truncal lymphedema from mas uh, following mastectomies? Yes, truncal lymphedemas, uh, um, um, I've seen a uh, few, but not as common as the uh, uh, arm or the leg. Uh, I have not done any surgery for them, although trunk, uh, like for example, I've done it for like scrotal lymphedema, but not for the chest wall or abdominal walls. But it is possible that uh, uh, either lymphovenous bypass procedure or lymph node transfer could be uh, could be uh, useful. Uh, now, with trunk lymphedema, though, oftentimes it's, it's, it, it is very hard to evaluate. Uh, it's hard to measure because you don't have a normal, normal side to compare with. So when somebody say they have trunk uh, lymphedema, it's hard to know whether there is a lymphedema or it's obesity, and uh, it is more difficult to evaluate. And, and, and I think that's one of the reasons why it's, it perhaps is one type of lymphedema that is underdiagnosed. Uh, but I personally have not done any uh, surgeries for these patients, although I have seen some patients who claim to have trunk lymphedema. Um, one question is, how many lymph nodes do you transfer with when you transfer surgery? Well, I don't particularly count them. Uh, grossly, you can see bigger, big ones. Uh, there are smaller ones that uh, are within the fat tissue we take that we don't necessarily tease out because we are concerned that it may uh, damage the blood supply. But I would say probably several lymph nodes, uh, two, uh, probably two at minimum, two to three, uh, sometimes up to four or five, perhaps, the smaller ones. Um, this hus husband stating uh, his wife has stage four breast cancer. Will move, doing the lymph node transfer cause this cancer to spread? Well, if somebody has stage four uh, metastatic breast cancer and the uh, patient uh, uh, is receiving chemotherapy, probably she's not a candidate for uh, lymphedema surgery. She probably needs to do whatever is possible to uh, treat the breast cancer and uh, first. And once she is cured of uh, uh, cancer, then you may consider uh, uh, a surgery for lymphedema, and depending how severe it is, perhaps it can be a candidate for lymphovenous bypass. And uh, would lymph node transfer uh, cause the spread of the uh, breast cancer? Well, if patient has active breast cancer, I certainly wouldn't do it. But if she's cured, then it, it's then it's fine. I mean, most of my patients are breast cancer, have lymphedema secondary to breast cancer, and, but they are cured. So, uh, and uh, it is not a problem for them. If a patient has stage one or two lymphedema, are they for 20 years? Are they still candidates? It can be. Uh, you know, I used to think at the beginning that uh, there was the duration of lymphedema uh, uh, was one of the major factors. But I have seen patients who ha have lymphedema for five, ten years, who have mild lymphedema, either because they have a mild obstruction, or uh, patients are very good at taking care of their limb. And uh, it is possible that they will respond well to uh, uh, surgery. Now, there are patients who've only had lymphedema for only a few months, but maybe because of their obstruction is very severe, maybe damage to the lymphatic system is very severe, uh, their lymphedema is very severe. And uh, even though they have not had lymphedema for a long time, oftentimes uh, they do not respond well to uh, a lymphatic surgery. So uh, duration of lymphedema alone is not the only factor, although it can be a factor. Are growth hormones being used with um, the tra transfer surgery? Well, in Europe, uh, there is a uh, lymphedema growth hormone uh, called the lymphactin. Uh, has been developed. Uh, again, it is controversial because uh, particularly with patients who had a history of cancer, 
whether injecting uh, any type of growth hormone is, is oncologically safe. Uh, so it certainly it's not has been approved in the United States yet. Uh, but uh, so I would be, I personally would be hesitant to uh, use it in my patients, but I think more studies need to be done in this area. Postoperatively, uh, how long, how many times do you need to see the patients over a period of time? Well, I like to see my patients regularly, but uh, most of my patients are from from long distance, either out of state or out of country, and it may, it's not practical. So what I usually do, depending on the type of surgery I do, um, I like to see them early. Like, for example, if I do lymphomenous bypass procedure, I will see the patient the next day, and they will usually fly back home. I like to see them back in three months, uh, and then six months and a year. Uh, but obviously, if they're far away, they, it's, it's not very practical for some to come back on, on, their frequency, on their frequently. If they're living locally, I would like to see them in three months, six months, year, and then yearly basis. Uh, with the lymph node transfers, their hospital stays will be longer uh, because surgery is a little more ex extensive, so they'll stay in the hospital about three to four days, uh, and I will see them back within a week. And then again, if they live locally, I will see them at a month, three months, six months, a year. If they from uh, long distance, of course, we'll just have to uh, adjust that uh, and fit the uh, patient's schedule. They have a, twins, one with lymphedema. Would be you able to tra do a transfer? <laughs> Are they identical twins? Ident yeah. Uh, I think because... Fortune. Yeah, I think because there are ways we can manage lymphedema without transplant, without taking lymph nodes or lymphatic vessels from the other, other twin, I would, I would not risk taking the lymph nodes or lymphatic from the other twin and then uh, cause a, uh, potentially cause a lymphedema in the other twin as well. So I would probably just not do that, uh, even if they were immunologically uh, identical. There are no more questions, uh, so are we finished? Okay, thank you for your attention.